Hi. My name is Peter Zosky, and what an honor this is. <laughs> well, um, I'm full of questions about the day, the week, the world, but I want to know how you did at the CBC today with the kids. Uh, the kids who were making the city? Yeah. Uh, they weren't making it today because <laughs> I, I saw what they did yesterday, which was delightful. But because um, apparently it's iffy that there's a, going to be maybe, maybe not a teacher strike, and somehow or other this translated into the children can't come. today. So um, all that was there was what they did yesterday, but it was enough to whet your appetite for w wishing that you could have seen the same thing being made. Um, you saw what was important. Uh, just, just seeing what they had contrived the day before. There was a big candy factory. <laughs> what a nice idea. <laughs> that was one of the prominent central things in this city. <laughs> and another prominent central thing was get your pure water here, <laughs> uh, naturally filtered. No, lots of signs about the, about the water, and that was very important. No pollution, it said, no pollution made. Uh, <clears throat> so. I thought that was a nice combination. Uh, <laughs> there was also a potato chip factory. <laughs> now, how does that fit in with, <laughs> with cities and the wealth of nations? How does, how does a children wanting their own candy factory, their own potato chip factory, is that import replacement? Does yes, that it work? is. <laughs> yes, it is. It's, it's economically very sound. It's uh, ridiculous that you should import your potato chips from a long way off. But we don't grow many potatoes in Toronto. <laughs> I know, but you can make them. And they, then they are not necessarily frozen. Well, that's french fries. Um, <laughs> that's different. I guess... Um, the potato chips uh, travel better, maybe, than the <laughs> frozen french fries. But uh, candy, every good city should have at least one, and preferably quite a few candy factories. <laughs> and so I think they were quite This is sad. obviously a very popular idea. <laughs> <laughs> And was this all going on in the CBC building? No, this was uh, going on at Harborfront. Oh. What I saw in the CBC building uh, with the young people, they were teenagers and they weren't making a city, but they were uh, taking up very serious subjects in a very responsible, um, thoughtful way. And they had worked out a couple of um, questions from what they had done earlier uh, that they asked me about. And one was about places for teenagers, and the other one was about employment. And two really uh, very live, serious subjects that they had been uh, thinking hard about. Should you make places for teenagers? Well, my answer on that was, I don't know whether it's the right answer, that uh, this question divides itself into two, in a way. One is that there are lots of places where teenagers ought to go, along with a lot of other people, uh, like libraries, t uh, like the streets, uh, like stores. Um, and that teenagers should be welcome in such places. 
um, they, they shouldn't feel segregated. And I mentioned that a lot of adults are frightened of teenagers. In groups. In groups. And <clears throat> that if large groups come, and I recommended that if they're in large groups, that they kind of ooze into these places. <laughs> <laughs> and don't frighten the susceptible grown-ups. So that's one kind of place. That's one thing. Then there, of course, ought to be places for teenagers where they can do their own things, like have their bull sessions and their uh, music and uh, stuff like that. And that I did not think there was any big blanket answer uh, for that. that in fact, if you tried to make standard places for teenagers to go, it would be very disappointing. That the, and if you have one agency provide these things, or you try to lobby it as a political thing, uh, I didn't think that was very hopeful, that you uh, need a lot of different such places where teenagers can be. But wouldn't you need some overreaching idea or, dare I say, plan that would some way to make sure that happened? I think you make sure it happens in a lot of local places, really local. And the, the accumulation makes a lot of places for teenagers to go. Local brings me right to a central question that I'd would like to put to you. But I'm not leaving the CBC conversation until I hear a comment from you about that dreadful building where I used to work. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> I have been in that building quite a bit, and... I know. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen more of you on television than I've seen hockey this year. <laughs> But my and liked it better, I have to say. <laughs> but my season is not as long as the hockey <laughs> season. God's season is not as long as hockey. The CBC building, do you hate it? Well, I was in the Glenn Gould Auditorium, ah, that's nice. which is a very nice yes. space. And I don't hate that at all. I, uh, I enjoyed that. Um, you know, it's a big place, and I was glad to see the recent times I've been in that it's gotten um, a little more human with uh, tables and chairs and out in the corridors, and you know what? There was even some group there. I don't know who they were or why they were doing it, but they were running a bake sale. And once you get a bake sale in the CBC building, it's an improvement. <laughs> what about the aquarium in the basement? I never saw that. They haven't got it yet. <laughs> so, but apparently they're going to have one. Is that a good idea? Yeah, sure, an aquarium anywhere is a good idea. <laughs> Fish are marvelous to watch. <laughs> When I was a kid, I used to write on the front page of my scribbler my own version of what I'm sure most people in the world wrote. Mine went Peter John Zosky Brown, because my mother had remarried, Upper Duplex, 24 Park Avenue, City of Galt, Township of North Dumfries, County of Waterloo, Province of Ontario, Dominion of Canada, continent of North America, Western Hemisphere, the world, the galaxy, the universe. Uh -huh. And I have since thought many times, because it's changed for me, if those are concentric circles, which one defines me? Which one is mine? Because when I was a kid, I would have answered Galt. I live in Galt, which doesn't exist anymore. It's now part of Cambridge, Ontario. But now it's a very different answer. What's yours? What's the defining circle for you? Well, um, 
I say Toronto or I say Albany Avenue, but really, um, since I've seen fractals, you know fractals? No. <laughs> well, <laughs> they're very pretty um, pictures and very fascinating. They're a kind of, look, you've seen packages of maybe Baker's chocolate where there was a woman with a, with a package of Baker's chocolate and yes. on the package was a woman with a package of Baker's chocolate. It used so, to be Old Dutch Cleanser used to be like that. Yeah. The woman holding the can of Old Dutch Cleanser. <laughs> yeah, and it got littler yeah. and littler. Yeah. That was a fractal, but they didn't know it. <laughs> ah, uh, and I've seen them then and I didn't know it either. Well, fractals are, it's a, <clears throat> when you first look at one, one of these pictures, uh, there it is, a big picture, and it's got them all full of patterns. Uh, in a way, it looks very incomprehensible and disorderly. But you begin to look and you see that the pattern is the same as the big pattern. And in that is another pattern that's ju just the same thing. but. Uh, smaller and smaller, and down to the tiniest little scallop on the edge of this is the same whole big thing, uh, but it's little. Now the question is, is the fractal made, is it little things in a big thing, or is it a big thing made of little things? And it's actually both. Um, in um, biology or in ecosystems um, or in your own body which has cells that are combined into uh, clumps of cells and so on and tissues um, but it, they all go back to that, that uh, little cell that makes it up and in fact within the cell there are little smaller organisms that make it up uh, <clears throat> the thing is that if you remove one of the big things, I'm not saying you could remove the universe, uh, you can still have the little ones. But if you remove the little ones, it's just a hollow big thing. It collapses. This is very abstract, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it's uh, also, but the point is, you live in, once you know about fractals, you know that you live in all of them at once. Did you duck my question? <laughs> so, I, now, <laughs> now I think I live at 69 Albany, and I also live in the universe. And, um, I'm at home in all of them. And none of the boundaries is more important than the other boundaries? What about the Canadian boundary? You live at 69 Albany Avenue, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Mm -hmm. Does it matter? Sure, all of them matter. <laughs> but none more than others? Uh, some matter. If you're paying your income tax, it <laughs> and I am, <laughs> then we all know which one matters more. Um, if you're um, going to, you know, go to bed, you know that which one matters more for that. <laughs> we we live in all these things at once. If you go out. My, I've got just a couple superstitions, and one of them is wishing on a star. That's, uh, in a way, it's my form of praying. And so then I'm at home in the universe, and I'm connected. Was your analogy with the body, was that a bit of biomimicry I just heard? <laughs> uh, it, it certainly is related to that. And we had a wonderful talk I the heard. other morning. Um, 
by Janine Benyus. We had wonderful talks this morning by Alana Probst and by Ursula Franklin. And did the day, did today emerge with a theme for you? Was there a theme through the day? Because I know there have been for some of the other days. Yesterday, the theme that emerged was values. Today, uh, yes, a theme emerged, but I didn't know what it was until the day was wearing on. And then I saw there was a pattern to the, to the whole day that began to reveal itself. <clears throat> so it was a pattern of impasses and how do you overcome them or what do you do about them. And <clears throat> the first talk, Alana's, was about the impact of uh, jobs and conservation, which is, it's, it's often put in the form of an impasse. Do we have conservation it's, it's like e or, or do we get jobs? The, an extreme example, of course, is always the one about uh, do we log or do we save the forest or, or uh, cut it selectively? And Alana addressed this head on with a wonderfully hopeful uh, and I think very true and constructive approach of uh, conservation based economic development. And it really makes sense. It makes economic sense above all. A lot of people haven't seen that yet, but it does. But you know, you can call it conservation-based development, um, or you can call it development-based conservation. Uh, they're, they're the same thing. But it's a way of overcoming an impasse. And she gave a lot of examples. And there are a lot more possibilities that can come up. Now, Ursula Franklin, when she spoke, she talked about the political and social impasse of things that are decided politically about the city and, um, or any other unit that don't take people into account and don't take nature into account. And the, the big theme was that Nature is important, and people are important, and nothing else is as important as those two. And that they belong together, and they must live in harmony, or, well, nature can get along without us, but we can't without nature. Um, but this is another kind of impasse, where uh, this is ignored politically and other considerations take priority at the expense of nature and at the expense of people. And that that is pretty fatal. And also, she talked about how this impasse can be overcome, uh, but not without a lot of civic action and with, with people feeling responsible about it. Now, I didn't think of these this theme that it was all about impasses until uh, some of the sessions I was in, I went to in the afternoon. And the children with their candy factory, but potato also, chip factory. <laughs> also with their uh, water uh, plant, their water filtration plant, and they had that impasse of how to overcome it all very much in mind, and very much, but obviously they were aware of the impasse, of that particular impasse. Then from there, uh, I went to the one we've been talking about, the other children, the teenagers. And Clearly, that's what they were thinking about, this impasse of their not wel being welcome and not having places to be. And even the terrible 
uh, tragic impasse of the homeless children, the street children, and what to do about places for them. Um, and also the terrible impasse, which can be very tragic too, of the unemployment uh, rate for young people and what to do about that. Uh, they're very concerned about that. We all ought to be. I thought about my own experience when I started working, <clears throat> and it was in the depths of the Depression. But um, we don't think we're in a depression now. But for young people where there's a 20% unemployment rate, this is just like the Depression, as far as they're concerned. This is really depression. And uh, that's an awful impasse. Uh, what to do about it? They were concerned about their rights and not being exploited, um, and with good reason. Uh, during the Depression, I was sometimes exploited in the jobs that I had. Uh, uh, there ha you have to find out how you can, uh, what you should be paid, what your rights should be, uh, and all that, and how you can get them. Because there are people uh, who will take advantage of a high unemployment rate like that. Uh, you also have to think about how you can get experience, um, so on. So they have very, very serious problems that they were thinking hard about. Um, now, we've thought too often that the solution to such impasses is well, we'll ask the government to settle this for us, but they don't really uh, settle it very well. Uh, and they certainly aren't doing much that's effective now about the youth unemployment. Then I went to a couple of other uh, sessions. And I was found myself right in the middle of, an, of impasses in, in myself. This is when I began to see what the pattern of the day was. Um, these were sessions run by planners. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, plan there are a lot of good planners now, you know. Um, but I was I was a little depressed to find how much lip service to good ideas there is, but. Um, the lip service is not carried out in what happens then. One was about China and the... Um, that was the, the session called Jane Jacobs in China. Yeah, I've never been You've there. You've never been to China. No. <laughs> but your ideas have been to China. No, they haven't been. <laughs> lip service about my ideas has been to China. But when I saw what was being done in China, uh, it couldn't be more depressing to me. Specifically with? what? Well, you know, this barracks building, yeah. um, no diversity in it, no opportunity for diversity, and uh, this is the man who presented these these pictures said that well the kind of thing that I uh, was for that was for the North American culture but not really uh, for Chinese uh, culture well that puzzled me because the overseas Chinese don't build barracks with no diversity. And in fact, when barracks are built for them, like the um, new towns in the outside of Hong Kong on the, uh, I have been there. Mm -hmm. uh, well, then you've been the to China. New, <laughs> in the new territories. And 
they're just like the new towns in England because they were English civil servants who built these things. Uh, and in England, they work, you know, just like dismal housing projects anywhere. And they don't in Hong Kong, uh, in the new territories in Hong Kong. And that's because the Chinese re absolutely refuse to use them that way. They put all kinds of things in them. They mix up. Uh, uses like anything, they uh, improvise, uh, turns into a totally different thing. But it starts as a cookie cutter? It starts with the cookie cutter and then they overcome it. Now, the ones I was being shown today, the pictures in China, nobody was overcoming it and they were even saying, this is, this is the culture of China. But it was not the culture of China. And what was removed uh, was much more like the culture of North America or the overseas Chinese, all full of diversity. Uh, so that depressed me. That not only the idea that, that they had gone backwards in what they were building, but that a myth, maybe, maybe this is just peculiar to the people who were talking there, a uh, myth is being created that that's the way the Chinese are. Mm -hmm. um, it's not. It's the way planners are. <laughs> but what's the difference? If it's not cultural, why does something that starts as a cookie cutter in suburban Hong Kong blossom into Jane Jacobs in China, and something that started as a, a cookie cutter elsewhere doesn't. What's the difference? What's the, what's the engine? What breaks the impact? Regulations are the engine. Um, you see, the humanization and diversification that occurs uh, outside of Hong Kong, in suburban Hong Kong, you can also see it in Kowloon and in Hong Kong itself. It would never be allowed here, except it very illegally, um, because people are running little hotels by combining apartments. There, somebody will take in, uh, get themselves a washing machine or two, and begin running a laundry in their apartment for uh, other people and hanging the clothes up in the corridor because there isn't enough room in their apartment. Uh, they have all kinds of improvisations of how to make a living and how to get along and how to give services to each other that they need. Also, all kinds of little manufacturing things going on in these things that are ostensibly just residences. And that's the way the old courtyard buildings in the Chinese cities were, all full of improvisations of this kind and diversifications and services to each other. And the new planning, of course, would be the same way, except for the regulations that don't allow it. There are communities in this country, I, I'm not, I don't think Toronto would fall into, into this category, but communities where that is a very real choice between development and the preservation of the land, the water, the landscape, sometimes people's health. It's been my observation, generally, that if you put that decision into the hands of the citizenry itself, of the community, they will almost inevitably choose the jobs and the development, and the devil take the conservation. So how, uh, how do you balance that with, with your thought that if you put it into the hands of the people, it will work? Well, th that's back to Alana's first uh, talk this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, she began by explaining that she was from the fourth generation of a logging family, and that in her, she spent her childhood uh, with going to the where the logging was, they set up their sawmill and all that, and do the logging. Oh, and things boom there. Mm -hmm. And then they 
cut all the trees and they leave and the town collapses. And indeed, many of them have collapsed that she knew of. This was in Oregon. That kind of exploitation, which we know well in Canada, not only with logging, but mines, uh, all sorts of resource places, even farms, where um, in the Ottawa Valley, for instance, there were wheat farms that did very well at one point, and then when the western uh, prairies were opened and settled, um, they couldn't compete with those, and they fell into poverty, those towns. Uh, anything that is built on that kind of exploitation is very insecure. That's where you get... Not to the person who needs the job. That's security at itself. At the moment. At the moment. Yes. But... And that's a very long moment. A no, very it's not moment. a very long it moment. It is for the guy who's having it. No, it's not even very long for them. Um, do you think that the uh, people who put all this capital into their fishing boats and now there's no fish? Uh, you think that moment was long enough for them? No, anything that's overexploited, it's going to end in economic disaster for everybody concerned. So you have to regulate. No, you don't. You have to do it differently. From You don't just exploit, but you don't, you do it more slowly. No, that's no answer. It's a way of using the land differently. So it's sustainable. What you're doing is sustainable. Not just, uh, not just that you lengthen the moment that you can exploit it. And what she's concerned with is how to make these things sustainable. And largely by adding things that have been, again, diversification, uh, adding things that haven't been done. Uh, you know, nature itself is not simple. It's very, very complicated. And any ecosystem is an extremely complicated thing. And the minute we try to simplify it and exploit one thing or um, make some kind of a monoculture or mm -hmm. of some sort, we're going to be in trouble. The way to uh, deal with nature in a harmonious way is recognize that it's diverse in any place, not just uh, you know putting together the whole uh, globe, but in any single place it's diverse. So that in a, the, a particular place she was describing to us, um, one way of getting jobs is to um, put up cranberries and and in fact there's now a nice mail order business of cranberry products that uh, didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. um, the wood that they cut, instead of just shipping it all out, if you can get jobs making products from some of that wood, you don't have to cut as much wood and you still have good jobs and more of them and it's more sustainable. That's the idea in general. You diversify. But what part of the fracto makes the decision about the diversification? Because again, I'm going to, this is way back to my need to understand your thoughts about what are communities. You, can't, do, you can't make people creative by telling them, uh, be creative. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be economically sound for them to be creative, uh, feasible, both for the area itself and for what they can do. And well, what Alana was describing was helping people see this and helping supply uh, what's missing that they need. For one thing, 
what's apt to be missing is uh, marketing of these things. And somebody can help on that. People who understand marketing can help on that. Um, People from the larger community? Yes, because uh, the marketing is going to be done in cities. Mm -hmm. And you have to have a certain city point of view uh, for this to make, to make it work. Um, one example she showed, again with the cranberries, was uh, how they could help with uh, the packaging uh, to make it more attractive. And of course, they are very conscious of everything being as sustainable and as uh, non-wasteful as possible. Well, you may be sure that this packaging was ecologically sounder than uh, what there was before, as well as being more attractive. Then there are the oysters that come from this area, and it's the most uh, it's the cleanest area left on the whole Pacific coast. And the oysters there were just selling for the same as any oysters. Just in the, but they're very superior oysters. A premium on cleanliness. Exactly. And you see, that's like those kids. There's those kids in the CBC. Who had their filtration plant. Get your <laughs> clean water here. Well, get your clean oysters from Willapa Bay. <laughs> and now they sell for three times the price of other oysters. They actually do. So you see, it's economically very desirable for the oyster growers. It's economically very sound to... But who made that, excuse me, who made that decision to uh, the, do it? The, the people the of pe the community itself? The people of the community. It won't work unless the people of the community um, but why didn't they make it before, when they were hacking the trees down? They, they needed a, well, uh, they needed a little help to see what else was From whom? Where, from what part of the fracto? The fracto came from Portland, Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> see, a lot of people, including me, are going to be a little cranky with you for saying you need a city point of view to do these things. This is the age, Jane, when the, when the city point of view doesn't have geographical boundaries on it. I know. You should, you should come with me to rural Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. to a gorgeous little town that you come off the coast and you drive down the hill into this beautiful place. I'm not going to name it because I'm trying to keep it special. <laughs> Although when I was there, the guy said, aren't you from Toronto? And I said, yes. And he said, so you're here to buy a house, eh? I said, no, I'm here to visit some people. He said, you're the first person from Toronto who's come here who isn't going to buy a house. <laughs> but that little town is full of more sophistication of the kind that you, Miss Jacobs, dare to say is only citified sophistication. No. So aren't those the ideas wrong now? Uh, oh, <laughs> no, no, uh, I agree with you. My uh, daughter lives in a little town in British Columbia, a uh, tiny little town. I think it's got 800 people in it. It's got a lot of sophistication. It has a bakery we would be proud to have in, in Toronto. Um, it has a paper maker there, uh, an artist actually. Um, you know, the AGO would be proud to show her paper things. Maybe they will sometime. Any alleys in those pages? Yeah, there are alleys. She's got an alley. Yeah. Because <laughs> when you pick paintings, they often have alleys. <laughs> um, but let's see, where were we? Well, I'm, well, trying, I'm trying to establish <laughs> your sense of, of the critical mass. And once again, I'm way back to the wealth of cities. Surely you can start with a monoculture. We always have, in a way, haven't we? No. We haven't always started with a monoculture, have we? No. <laughs> but Newfoundland 
See, when you had the guy who's investing all those dollars in the, in the, in the his fishing boat, my head in, instantly goes to Newfoundland. I don't know how you're going to stop that guy from doing that, from putting that money, because he doesn't look on the cod as a finite resource. To him, it's not a finite resource. You need a greater community, a greater viewpoint, a Jane Jacobs viewpoint, that can come in and say, don't do that. Don't do that right now. It's, it's self-defeating. Grow cranberries. <laughs> They're wonderful. <laughs> Well, you can't just say to people, don't do that. You, um, you have to say, hey, you're able to do this. I mean, it has to be positive, not just negative. The trouble with regulations is they're always telling you what you can't do. Yeah. And the um, way Alana was going at it, uh, and the way her group goes at it is to show you what you can do, uh, but not tell you you have to do it. You know, there's, there's an awful lot of, um, well, I see it here, um, so many bright people so, at, at this conference, so many bright people. I'm, I'm just filled with admiration and uh, so many good ideas, so much concern. You find this in lots and lots of localities, yeah. and it's there. And it often needs a little encouragement or to, sh to show how to use it to better advantage, uh, and that you don't have to do what you were always doing uh, in the past, or what your parents did, or what your grandparents did, uh, if indeed the town lasted long enough for that. And a, a little encouragement and support. And Nova Scotia has benefited from that, too, and has benefited from that kind of viewpoint from right here in Toronto. Did you ever hear of Calmetta? Yes. Well, that's a Toronto organization. Well, its and, office is in Toronto. And it's doing a lot in Nova Scotia to um, make microloans to people there to make these sophisticated and wonderful things that they do, that they didn't have any capital available to start themselves out. And it's economically sound for them to do it, and it diversifies the economy of Nova Scotia better. But, uh, and you may wonder, well, why didn't that start in Halifax? Why didn't they have the idea of microloans? right there that it was needed, right there the people that could use it. Um, but it, and I don't know why the idea didn't occur to somebody in Halifax, but it occurred to somebody in Toronto. Martin. It, uh, Martin Connell. Connell, thanks. Yeah. And his wife, Linda Higgs. Yeah. And uh, they've, they've been helping out people in um, Nova Scotia this way. It's not that people in Nova Scotia are stupid or unsophisticated or they needed all their good qualities and possibilities put together with something that was lacking. And very often, Peter, it is the city viewpoint that sees what is lacking. Or the community viewpoint. Or the Ontario viewpoint? No, not the Ontario <laughs> viewpoint in general. <laughs> yeah, I'm still... What, why? Not up north of 401. <laughs> I live north of 401 and like it. Okay, I thought I'd get you that way. <laughs> Why do you need Martin Connell and Linda and, and private enterprise to do that sort of work? Why can't you just make your governments do it? Why have we lost control of our governments? Why oh, we I haven't do? lost control of the government, uh, we except feel our that. provincial government. <laughs> <laughs> governments are very uninventive. Governments never invent anything. The things that you think governments do so well 
they weren't all invented outside of government and then taken over by governments. Um, the postal system. Well, we went into this yesterday. I don't want to go into all this again. Yeah. You just take it on faith. <laughs> I do take it on faith. I take everything you say on faith. But you like being challenged, don't you? Uh, sure, but I don't like being challenged the same thing two days in a row. <laughs> <laughs> I loved your idea about, about civic transport. In, in Toronto, about solving the, the, the public transit thing by putting it into the hands of, of people who would work out their own route. Yeah, and you know, it's a fine time in history for this to happen because we have a lot of immigration from uh, places where they do exactly that. People, a lot of our immigrants know all about this. They know more about it than, than uh, you know, old-time Canadians, or the Canadian government, or anybody. And it would be a wonderful uh, moment in history that just what we need, we've got immigrants who could do it. Yeah. Other people could do it too, but um, there are loads of immigrants he here now who know how to run informal transportation systems if they haven't run them themselves, they've used them a great deal. It, it's not an unfamiliar idea to them. But what, what are the limits of regulation? Is it possible to, to, to make a, a generalization about what we should regulate? I mean, I'm just... It's, you have to be careful because uh, Again, you shouldn't get abstract about this. Uh, what it has to be the specific things, and they change over time. For instance, uh, back when I came to Toronto in 1968, there was not a single outdoor cafe at that time in Toronto. In fact, you couldn't sit. On your, in your own backyard and legally take a drink of alcohol. No. Uh, and certainly not on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> and, or on your front porch. It was illegal in Toronto to have a drink of alcohol outdoors. Yeah. Because a child might see it. Yes. <laughs> that was the thing. That was it. I'm not making that up. I know that. I was here. <laughs> Breaking the law, I might say. <laughs> You should have come to Ward's Island. <laughs> I know everybody broke the law. Yeah. Um, but we still do. We still have some regulation, but, for example, of the see, sale of alcohol, was, and there, we agree with that. Yeah, but we? there was another reason for no outdoor cafes. You could have outdoor cafes, uh, after all, with cafe, with coffee. Yeah. Uh, and, and food. But this regulation had been made back when the streets were full of horses and the horse flies. And it really was not very good and sanitary uh, to sit on the sidewalk and sell food and so on. But times had changed, but the regulation hadn't. Uh, now, when um, the n first infill housing was done here, yeah. down on Sherburne Street, yeah. uh, <clears throat> we had a real genius in Toronto at breaking red tape. That was Michael Dennis, untangling red tape, whatever it is you do with red tape. Uh, but pr that probably couldn't have been done without him, uh, without somebody who was that good at it. Uh, now, what these regulations that prevented it had all to do with the amount of um, square feet of window for square feet of floor and distance of buildings from each other. And those regulations had all been made at a time when the tuberculosis rate was terribly high and when it was uh, believed, even before they knew about the tuberculosis bacilli and how to, how to combat it, um, and how it, how it traveled and what lowered resistance to it and so on, they had 
these regulations about distance of buildings, courtyards, mm -hmm. width of courtyards, uh, amount of uh, window, were all calculated uh, to combat tuberculosis. And there they, we got it tuberculosis in other ways, but the regulations lived on. So uh, what's a good regulation? Well, for one thing, knowing why it's in there and knowing when it's no longer necessary. Uh, knowing when a different regulation is necessary. Those are of the essence, but these are things that governments and bureaucracies are very bad at. But can't we change them? Can't we teach them? Um, can't we take to the barricades and stop this expressway? Can't we, can't <laughs> we change the world by changing yeah. the institutions? Now, there were all these regulations in place to segregate uh, residences from uh, workplaces uh, and so on. They're still in place. Uh, here are planning departments that uh, have learned a lot of things, but they have not learned how to do away with uh, useless regulations or um, you know, they could have made themselves so busy in a useful way with <laughs> dismantling regulation. Now it's being done in Toronto a, a little bit. It's being done in those two Kings areas. It's being done in some other places. But the, this country and the United States is full of architects who just break their hearts uh, fighting regulations that are uh, destructive. Uh, they have wonderful ideas. They have beautiful ideas of what they can do. They don't have, every one of them doesn't have a Michael Dennis to, uh, who's a genius at untangling red tape. And nobody is really going at this untangling the way they should. Um, Look, we've got a lot of nuclear energy plants that um, we wish had never been built now, and uh, they were never economically sound, and they're being decommissioned. It, you know, it takes as big an establishment and as, about as much money to decommission them as it did to build them. Well, it's the same way with planning. It takes about as many planners, I think it would, to decommission all these regulations uh, that make it illegal for people to work at home, uh, that um, make it illegal to mix perfectly good things together, that make it illegal to have narrower streets than, than uh, the great big wide ones that the suburbs are full of, for instance. You love the new St. George, don't you? Yeah, the new St. George. Yeah. Isn't that nice? Yes, it is. That, that's a real, but, real improvement to, to the city. How do we separate the non-ideological woman whom the world is paying such a lovely tribute to now from a total anarchist? Let me, let me come back to the unemployed kid, where we started, sort of. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of, when, when you talked about being exploited in the Depression, and yes, people were, and you talked about the kids being exploited today, you know who I thought of? These young people, not the ones who are taking the mech jobs, because I kind of understand that mm -hmm. and wish them graduation. But kids are going to work at places for nothing. Yeah, that's They're an I opportunity did. to do it. That's They're going not... to work <coughs> so they can learn and have experience mm -hmm. and answer that enraging question that we all had when you're, I need a, a job, have you got any experience? No, but how can I get it until you give me the job? But they're getting it to get that. Now, the only way to do that is to make it illegal to exploit kids that way. Regulate. Mm 
You just need better government. So you don't need, if government backs off, they'll all do that, those bandits. They'll hire oh, those kids. Oh, I had exactly the opposite advice for them. For the kids? Yeah, I said there were two kinds of jobs yeah. um, that they could go after. And one was jobs w where they needed to learn and where they couldn't learn what they need to learn in an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and that when people are learning this way formally, they call it that they're being interns. They used to call it apprentices. Yeah. Nowadays, they call it interns. Then there's they used to call it slaves, too, at another time. No, no, not, no. Slaves weren't allowed to learn okay. like this. Uh, there were all kinds of laws and regulations against slaves learning uh, when, when there was slavery in the United States. Um, they weren't allowed to learn to read and write. It, it was illegal to teach them in many places. No, no, this is not slavery I'm talking about. Um, I'm talking about actually learning. I did this. I went to a newspaper in, when I got out of school. Uh, I didn't want to go to school any longer. And I wanted to, to work in a newspaper. And it was the Depression. And they said they couldn't hire me. They had no money. And I made the offer. I said, can I work for you for nothing? Mm -hmm. And the editor said, he was surprised at this. This was not his idea. And he, and he said, um, we can, uh, all right, and we can see how it works out, whether we like it, whether you like it. And I went to work, and that was my journalism school, and I didn't have to pay any tuition. And I learned a lot by doing, and then I had a, he assigned one of the reporters there to sort of look after me and be my mentor. And I wrote things, and they put them in the paper, and I got a big bang out of that. And I learned, I learned a lot, and I couldn't learn it in an hour and a half. I learned it in a year that I was there. Yeah. Uh, I got my money's worth. Uh, you might say, I don't feel I was exploited in that job. I know you want to move to the, the other kind of job. The, the but, other but, kind but, of... Can I just tackle you for one thing? God, I'm going to run out of time. I can't believe it. This is a three-hour radio program, is it not? <laughs> <laughs> but what did you say to the guy on your newspaper? Because I went to the same journalism school you did, except they paid me $40 a week. Hey, that was a fortune. It was, I know, I did fine. <laughs> I, but what do you say, because about a year after you've been there, that city, that editor who didn't think to offer you the job for nothing, makes a, goes out in the newsroom and calls in Carruthers, who's been there for 40 years and, and is supporting his family, and says, Carruthers, we don't need you anymore. I've got a young woman here who worked for virtually nothing. I'm going to start paying her $5 a week now. I know how smart she is. She's going to grow up and change the world, and they'll have conferences in her honor. But Carruthers, you can go home now, because we don't need you anymore. What do you say to those people? Well, that's a very hypothetical question, because it didn't happen. <laughs> At the, uh, nobody... it's a, I know, but it's real, Jane. It's, it's a real question. If you let kids do jobs for nothing, They'll surely drive out the people who have been doing those jobs for money. You're thinking that the world is all arranged on a zero-sum thing, that there's just this much of an, of an economy, and um, somebody gets something in it, somebody else loses. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's not, that's a company town economy. It's not a city economy. And when people uh, complain that the economy is growing. Uh, you can't have it both ways, you know. Uh, they don't have to fire Carruthers, and they don't have to t uh, tell me I don't have a job. Mm -hmm. um, actually, the way this worked out yes. <laughs> was that at the end of a, of a year, I decided I wanted to go to New York and seek my fortune and try to get a job. Uh, this was still, in fact, the newspaper 
uh, went under, <laughs> not then, but a little <laughs> while later. <laughs> Uh, the town just couldn't support that many newspapers as it had. Yeah. Uh, so I went to New York and I didn't um, get a job on the newspaper there either. But, so it's very hypothetical. Okay, it's hypothetical in a Jane Jacobs world. That no, was the real world I'm telling you <laughs> yeah. about. Yeah. I, uh, how do you spell zero? You said zero, <laughs> zero sum economy. How do you spell zero? Uh, it's a big goose egg. <laughs> spell the word for me. Uh, Z-E- Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> because if you phone the switchboard at the Ministry of Truth, where they were having the bake sale today, if you phone the, the switchboard, They'll tell you, if you know the name of the party who you are calling, spell it on their thing with your push button thing. And for Z, press 9 or whatever it is. The CBC says Z. And Jane oh. Jacobs is carrying the torch for Z. God bless you. <laughs> in, in fact, if I may dare to offer a concluding for now thought. May it only be that the celebration and tribute to you continues to the, your own delight so much it has it has. And if I may repeat myself, Jane Jacobs, from 35 seconds ago, God bless you all together. You're a treat. <laughs> and the same to you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.